I'm excited today to talk about marriage, because I love marriage. Um, my wife and I have been married for 16 years, four kids, as Mitch said, and uh, it's been so good. Like, I, and I don't just say that because I'm a marriage speaker. I mean, it's just been so, so good, like supernaturally good. Um, You've you got to understand, before I got married, my ministry was terrible. Um, I mean, seriously, I, I was a youth pastor, and then and I remember my first youth ministry, I took this youth ministry of 200 kids, and I, and I grew it to about 100, and, uh, <laughs> you know, and then became an associate pastor, and the church split, and uh, every, everything just fell apart, and then seriously, I, I got married, and it, it really did change everything. There's just so much laughter in the home, and I, I never had anyone in my life... Um, totally support me. Like I, like, I never felt like I had someone that I knew was always going to back me up. And when I had that, it was this new confidence. I, I understood what the scripture said about how it's not good for a man to be alone, but just to know that there's someone that I'd come home to every day who was going to build me up and encourage me. Uh, it, was, it was insane. I was not used to that. It was one of these surprises in marriage. I mean, it's, it's one of those things where we were married two weeks. We were married for two weeks. When I came home one day, I go, honey, I think God wants me. I know we've never talked about this before, but I feel like God wants me to start a church. And, and I go, this means I don't know if anyone's going to show up. You know, we'll just do it out of the house, and, and I'll wait tables if I have to or whatever. I go, but, but I'm not going to take any money from the church, so you're going to have to support us. And, um, and I know that's not the way it normally works, but it's something I just think God's calling us to. And I'll just never forget. You know, I was so nervous because here I was thinking God was calling me to something. And how do you say something like that to your bride of two weeks? Um, and I just still remember her looking at me and, and she just says, you know, if you believe this is what God's called you to do, this is why I married you. I believe you're going to lead me wherever God's, God wants us to go. And if that's what you believe God's called us to, I support you 100%. I, I'd never had that before. I, I'd never had someone behind. I, I had a lot of people say, oh, that's a stupid idea. Oh, yeah, that's really going to work. You, you know, I've, I've had that my whole life. But then to have someone come alongside and go, no, this is why I married you. I believe that you were going to follow God. And I believed you would lead me there. And, and little did I know, but that was going to be the very thing that made our marriage so wonderful. Like, like Mitch said earlier, this isn't just about marriage. It, it's about this greater calling we have of serving God, this greater calling of making disciples. And marriage is a wonderful means to that end. But we have to be careful that, that we don't just focus on marriage, but that our marriages are focused and focused on the mission, on what God's called us to do. Because at the end of our lives, we could have a wonderful, happy marriage, and then at the end of our lives, God's not going to say to us, well done. That, that's not what he asked us to do. You know, he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant to those of us who are pursuing the things that he's called us to. And when we do that, that's what keeps it together. See, my desire is one day I want my wife, Lisa, to stand before God and for God to look at her. I mean, you understand what an intense moment that's going to be to stand before a holy God? I mean, you and I right now are breathing because of this being who gave us life, who created us. And he, he says that all things were created by him and for him. He didn't make me so I would just walk this planet and enjoy my life and have a happy little marriage and happy little kids. He created me for something. And one day, I'm going to stand before that God. One day Lisa is going to stand before that God and I love her so much that I want her to hear the words from God Almighty. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You are faithful with what I gave you down there and now I'm going to put you in charge of so many things up here because that's for eternity. See, that's the goal, and that's the goal that she has for me. She wants me to stand before God one day and say, well done. See, that's what this is about. Unbelievers, I mean, I know people who don't know Jesus that have wonderful marriages and happy marriages. But we've got to be focused on this mission. And when we focus on this mission, that's what makes our marriages so, so wonderful, so enjoyable. I mean, I tell you, I can't imagine life without Lisa. 
I can't imagine life without this woman. I can't imagine pursuing this mission of God without her um, because it, it really has changed everything. So I love talking about it. I love speaking about marriage. And it's just been an amazing thing. And I want to I share a passage with you today that, uh, that isn't the typical marriage passage. In fact, some have even seen this passage as anti-marriage. But to me, it's the secret to our marriage. And it's 1 Corinthians 7. And I say some see this as almost anti-marriage because in this passage, Paul's making an argument for being single. But if you understand the principle behind this passage, you realize, wow, this is the secret to it all. This is the secret to having a great marriage. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 29, Paul says this, This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none. There's a great verse to start with, right? <laughs> well, that Paul's saying from now on, okay, because time is short, from now on, those who have wives, you should live like you don't have a wife. What in the world is he talking about? This is the same Paul that tells us in Ephesians, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. But here in this context, he's saying, do you understand? Life is, this, this, this time is so short. The word is contracted. There's just a short period of time. It's the same thing Christ said where he says, you, you know, the, 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 the time is short or the time is at hand. Some of you may not know my, my testimony, but my mom actually died giving birth to me. And so that's why I moved out to Hong Kong. I was actually born in, in the States, but then I, I was sent off when I was like two weeks old to Hong Kong to grow with my grandmother. Um, my dad couldn't take care of us all. So my mother died giving birth to me, which is an awesome thing. Um, from what I understand, there were going to be complications, and she knew that ahead of time. But she says, you know what, I'll let God choose. And so that's a, like one of the most beautiful things in my life is to think that this woman gave her life so I could be here right now. That's insane. That, that's a legacy. And uh, so that's, so I understand the brevity of life. I came back to the States because my dad had remarried. And I had my family back together again. But then when I was about eight years old, my mother died in a car accident. My stepmom died in a car accident. My dad got married again. Yeah, he was a stud. <laughs> my, dad got, uh, my dad got married again. And... Uh, but then when I was 12, my dad died of cancer. So when I read this passage and it says, hey, look, it's not all about marriage. You understand, this time is short. And, and, and that means my, my mom, my stepmom, my dad, you know, by the time I was 12, they had all already come into the presence of God. For God to either say, well done, or to go, what did you do with your life? And so I look at this passage and I go, I know, I'm not, I'm not expecting, you know, this long life and everything else. I've seen it pass right in front of my eyes. And there's something bigger which is eternal. And we've got to understand that. And here he says that the appointed time has, has grown very short. Those who have wives live as though they had none. Verse 30, those who mourn as though they, they were not mourning. Those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing. And those who buy as though they had no goods. And those who deal with this world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. He goes, this present, you understand, whatever you're into, you can't get too into it because this earth in its present form is passing away. Do you understand that marriage, Scripture makes it very clear, is one of those things of this present form of earth. The Bible's very clear that we're not going to be married in heaven. My wife and I will not be married in heaven. Now, for some of you, go, wow, that's depressing, Right? You're looking at your spouse going, that's depressing. Others are you going, that's kind of exciting. You know, <laughs> no, no, I don't mean that. No, no, not here. But, but uh, no, the, the, the truth is, is, he says, you understand this world in its present form is passing away, and there's something eternal. And, and he's saying the time is short. And it's about this mission. You've got to get it. There's got to be a mission to your marriage. You both have to understand, look, here's what I'm on the earth to do. And Jesus made it really clear, didn't he? After he rose from the grave, he says, all authority has been given to me, and anyone who's been in church for a year or two has heard it and probably memorized it. Go and make disciples of all nations. Go, make disciples. 
You obey everything that I commanded you, and then you teach others to obey everything that I commanded you. When God gives us a command, we study it, we memorize it, but how many of us actually do it? I mean, how many disciples have you made? You know, I'm constantly encouraging my wife. I'm like, oh, you're such a great mentor. You could reach out to this neighbor or that neighbor, lead him to the Lord. You know, you, you can be an example. That we've always had people living in our house ever since we were married, just so they could see and so we could really disciple them because we thought, this house doesn't belong to us. It belongs to God. And so if people need a place to stay, let them stay here. And let's give them an example of a Christian marriage. Let's give them a, an example of a Christian family. A dad who loves his kids, a mom who loves her kids. Mom and dad who love each other, because so many people have never seen that. And let's make disciples. Let's train people up. It, you know, it's just so strange to me what we do in church sometimes with the commands of God. When, when you were a kid, remember, uh, remember playing Simon Says, you know, or, or follow the leader. Remember follow the leader? Some of you that are younger never played it because you can't get the app on your iPhone. But... Uh, <laughs> It was some physical. We used to go out and play, you know. We used to move. And, uh, and, and, and you remember follow the leader, you know. He's, leader jumps, you jump, you, you know. Or Simon says, Simon says, pat your head, and you pat your head. It's so weird how in the church we change everything. In the church, you know, follow Jesus has become a different game where in following Jesus, you don't actually have to do what he does. You just have to study it. Jesus says is completely different from Simon says. If Jesus says something, you just have to memorize it or study it. What about making disciples? What about actually becoming like Jesus? Man, I, I've got four kids, and, and if I asked one of my kids, if I, I told my oldest daughter, hey, Rachel, go clean your room. And, and what if she comes back to me, you know, an hour later and goes, Dad? I memorized what you said. <laughs> I can quote it verbatim. In fact, I can say it in the Greek now. <laughs> she knows I'm not going to go, oh, that's awesome, baby. Or, she, or if she says, Dad, I had a bunch of friends over and we did a little study on what it would look like if we cleaned my room. Here's all the notes. It's going to be a five-week study. You guys, she knows that doesn't fly with me. You guys, why were these commands given? Was it for us to memorize and study and on and on and on and just, just study them to death? And, and then at the end of our lives, we're going to go, God's going to say, wait, I, I asked you to make disciples. I asked you to baptize. How many people did you lead to the Lord? How many people did you, did you teach to obey everything? Because that's what I asked you to do while you were on that earth. And so my wife and I, what we do is, is we keep each other focused on that. Because this world in its present form is passing away. We've got to love each other beyond this earth. We've got to love each other eternally. Let's say I'm focused on who you're going to be before God. And I can't wait till we're walking around together with Him forever. That's the focus here. Verse 32. Paul continues and he says... I want you to be free from anxieties. He says, the unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. Paul was making a, a, a case for being single. He says, I've seen married couples. They get so into each other and their focus is, oh, how do I please my husband? How do I please my husband? How do I please my husband? And the men are all, oh, how do I please my wife? He goes, and their, their interests are divided. He goes, but I've seen the, the, the single man, the single woman, and they've got this undivided devotion to the Lord. They're just focused. What does God want me to do? What does he want me to do on this earth? See, the goal, though, at the end of it is to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. Here's the goal. 
God says, I want, uh, Paul says, I want every single individual just to have this undivided devotion to the Lord. I want you focused on him, focused on what he's called you to do, what he's made you to do, focused on eternal things. This undivided devotion to the Lord, I want you to think. What do you think about during a given day? Do you spend time thinking about family affairs or the Lord's affairs? Thinking about what God wants you to do as a family? Or just thinking about your family? Because I'm telling you, if you focus on the mission of God, that's what brings this whole thing together. There have been so many crazy ideas that the Lord has put in my mind, uncomfortable things that the Lord has put in my mind over the years, and to have one, someone support me. You know, after being married a couple months, to say, you know, I think we should let other people live with us. It's not a normal thing. Every time I said, you know what, I think we should just give everything we have away. I know, well, let's just empty the bank account because here's a need. And to see her respond and go, that's a little scary to me. I go, can you just trust me this time? Watch how good God is. And then time and time again, she's seen God's blessing. And to have someone support me in that, encourage me in that. I remember coming back from Africa and seeing the poverty over there the first time and just coming home to my wife and go, I'm such a mess right now. I love these little kids I met and I can't live in this house anymore. I feel like we should just give away as much as we can. Here's a mom, of, you know, uh, who's got her home and, and to say, I think we should just start looking at trailer parks, start looking at the cheapest thing we can find. If we're going to take this book seriously about love your neighbor as yourself. And I, I told her, I go, you know what, but I, I don't want to just make this decision. I want you to come to Africa with me. I want you to see what I've seen because I think you'll agree with me. And she says, no, I trust you. I don't need to go there yet. And for her just to, the next day, start walking around a trailer park, going, is this where we move our family? And finally move them into this tiny house. And here's the mother of four in this tiny house. We've taken a couple other people. And she's just rolling with it. And she goes to Africa with me, you know, after the fact. And she goes, wow, if I saw this, I wouldn't have even fixed up the house. I go, exactly. This is insane. Um, to, to, to coming home one day and going, man, there's this lady at the rescue mission. And... She's got three kids and she's pregnant. And uh, I don't know how in the world you're gonna have a baby in a rescue mission and, and take care of your other three kids. How are they ever gonna get back on your feet? I go, I'm thinking maybe they should live with us. And have a wife that goes, that's weird. I was praying this morning like, God, what do you want us to do with that extra room over there? And uh, I go, well, she doesn't speak English and I haven't even met her. And. Uh, <laughs> I just heard about her, and she goes, well, let's drive down to the rescue mission right now and have a wife to drive down the rescue mission and talk to this lady, and it's like, hola, um, mi casa, tu casa, you know, you, you, you know, trying to communicate. You guys, I'm telling you, it's, it's been nuts, and this journey we've been on, and, and God's been so good to us, but it's not about this life. It's about being effective in this life. Let's pray. Father, help us to get it. Help us to be about your mission. God, I thank you so much for creating marriage. It's so beautiful. It's so wonderful. I love it. And I love Lisa. Thank you for making her. I thank you for giving us a mission here on earth, a purpose here on earth, and being able to experience that together. And I pray for everyone watching today, Lord that they would live for eternity and prepare their spouses for eternity. It's going to be so good, Lord. I cannot wait to see you. I cannot wait to be with you. Help me to prepare Lisa for that day and the kids. Thank you for so many wonderful examples throughout history. Now, God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, would you have your words change us that we don't just memorize them, study them, but we obey them, and we do it. And together we go out and make disciples of all nations. And we teach them to obey everything that you commanded. In Jesus' name we pray.